We've got 48, 50, so that's over half, and I'm going to wow. go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Hello. David Preston, and I teach in the Santa Maria Joint Union High School District in Santa Maria, California, where I'm currently fortunate enough to pilot the Open Source Learning Academy. If you would like to learn more about open source learning, please do check out my book. This is the one plug I'll make for the day, Academy of One, available wherever you like to buy your books, and the links will be in the show notes. Uh, speaking of books, those of you who know me might be wondering where my comforting credibility bookcase is today. Um, with gratitude for the rains we've had here in California recently, that room is currently under construction. So like most of our social institutions, it's a good time to re-examine how we build things back better. Not to make this political, but in some senses, all of our learning is political, if only because we're here with each other and we have to navigate multiple understandings of what it is we're really doing around learning. That's fitting. Um, campus life as we know it has been hijacked obviously by the coronavirus pandemic, but that's the tip of the disruption iceberg. Social justice, economic and housing insecurity, climate change. These are just some of the forces that will change the way we school and educate ourselves and one another. And they inspire me, as do our panelists today, to constantly re-examine and investigate how we can improve things. It's my great privilege to host this conversation about ungrading with Aaron Blackwelder, Lauren Gibbs, and Jesse Stommel, three authors, contributing authors of the book Ungrading, and educators who inform and inspire learners, not only in their own courses, but really around the world. Uh, I myself have benefited hugely from our loose connections on Twitter and elsewhere. And thank you all three of us for joining us today. Glad to be here. So yeah, good to be here. Of, thank you. By way of introduction, um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists a question that relates to their path toward ungrading. And as they share their journeys with us, and I see some of the uh, participants are already doing what I'm going to ask. I'd like to invite everybody to share in the chat. Who are you? Where are you here from today? And what's your interest in ungrading? After we meet our panelists, I'll ask a few general questions and we'll discuss. And then Laura, Aaron, and Jesse have also created some brief presentations and we'll reserve the end for questions and answers. So please do feel free. I'll be monitoring the chat. Let us know what you'd like to learn more about with regard to ungrading as we go on. After the presentations today, after this event, I will email every registrant a link to a post with a recording and an annotated group of notes that are linked to all of the resources you hear about today, as well as the contact information for me and the panelists. So no need to focus on your notes. Be completely present here with us and away we go. So, Aaron, I'd like to start with you. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, Aaron Blackwelder teaches high school English and coaches boys and girls golf in Southwest Washington State. He's the founder of Teachers Going Gradeless. He is the host of the podcast Beyond the Curriculum and also serves as the educational contributor to Spectrum Life Magazine. Aaron is a Washington State English Teachers Fellow. He was nominated for Washington State Teacher of the Year in 2019 and is also a five-time golf coach of the year. Aaron is a husband and father of two boys on the autism spectrum who inspire him to become a teacher who meets the needs of all students. Aaron contributed a chapter entitled, What Going Gradeless Taught Me About Doing the Actual Work to the book Ungrading, which I most certainly want to promote. You can see it over his shoulder, but I'll give you the big view right now. And this will also be linked to prominently in the post. So Aaron, you operate at the intersection of the professional and the personal. And I think too often we make distinctions between these kinds of things, but in education, uh, you know, to be clear, we're not talking, talking about personalized learning right now. We're talking about an individual commitment to excellence. And your work shows that in all of your success with a diverse group of learners, including your own children, who you mentioned being on the autism spectrum. In the chapter that you wrote for Ungrading, you describe how grading impacted your teaching and your students. Can you take us a moment to walk us through that experience and tell us how you went from Richard Vernon to Mr. Hand? Yeah. So um, I absolutely love 80s uh, films. I mean, I'm a child of the 80s. I'm a Gen Xer myself, and I grew up all on uh, 
on those, those, those classic films. And I hope that all of you have the experience of watching movies like Fast Times on Richmond High and uh, The Breakfast Club. Um, but anyways, um, you know, when I, I entered the, te the teaching profession because I really wanted to make a difference. And I entered in, my first year was in 1998. And this was the dawn of uh, teaching standards. And um, I got caught up in it because this is what I was taught in my pedagogy classes that was right. And um, I was taught through uh, all of the curriculum development through our district. And, and as when I first entered the classroom, I felt alive and I felt like this is what I wanted to do. And it was all centered around building relationships. But over time, it became about standards and standardization. And I lost the connection with my students. And that, that uh, harkens to the, 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 the quote by Vernon where he's having the conversation with the janitor. Um, that, that he lost touch with his students. And that was something that I, that just resonated with me. And, and um, while I was doing my, um, my pre-service classes, um, I had a professor ask, who is the greatest movie teacher of all time? And of course we had Mr. Keating from, um, from uh, oh boy, uh, help me out here guys. Dead uh, Poets Society. Thank you, Dead Poets Society. We had Mr. Keating from Dead Poets Society. We had so many other teachers and the professor said, well, I think Mr. Han from Fast Times at Ridgemont High is and we're all kind of, ooh, why? And she goes, well, you know, she sets, or he sets standards. He was not going to budge on those standards of what was excellence. And he held every kid accountable to these standards. However, he wasn't gonna let a kid go. And when Jeff Spicoli was in danger of failing in class, he showed up to Jeff's house and walked him through American history and made sure that he was able to not just regurgitate information, but was able to synthesize and communicate his own personal ideas about American history. And I was floored by that. I was like, wow. And so that idea has resonated with me in my 23 years of education. Um, and so I, I, I will now always say that Mr. Hand is the greatest movie teacher of all time because of that. So did I answer your question there? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. And, you know, as I think about a stereotype like Mr. Hand, he was so intimidating to so many until you crack that layer of what this was really all about. Mm -hmm. And then people can be people with one another. Aaron, while you were talking, I've been looking at some of the chat and I wanna say welcome to everybody from all over the United States and even from my home district, John Davis, it's good to see you today. Uh, David Buck, really wonderful to see you. Minus 10 in Ontario. Um, I'm really excited that we're expanding the reach because what you describe is an extremely personal connection between people. And we live at this unique time that we're only coming to understand how we can take weak ties on the internet, how we can take a Zoom-based experience or an asynchronous-based ex experience and share that humanity in such a way that we can amplify and accelerate our learning. So thank you for that. Next up, we have Lauren, Laura Gibbs who has taught folklore and mythology courses online for the University of Oklahoma College of Arts and Sciences since 2003. Laura is also the author of the Tiny Tales series of folklore and mythology books, which I have personally fallen in love with. You can find that at 100words.lauragibbs.net. Laura is glad to share her experiences with asynchronous course structures, platforms, and tools, which is so important. And I'm gonna put a personal plug in we have a lot of effort right now going on in schools to replicate what was going poorly before, except now doing it online. And Laura is an absolute master of the art. Connect with her at Twitter, at Online Course Lady, CRS Lady, and also at Online Myth India. Laura contributed a chapter entitled Getting Rid of Grades to Ungrading. And Laura, you inspired me just this morning because before we came on, I was online with students and in the beginning of your chapter in ungrading, you started with a note about your original dissatisfaction. And you invited readers to explore their own experiences with grading and ask why the alternatives might appeal. And I did the same thing with my students this morning. And I learned a great deal. And it was validating, as you can imagine. I'm wondering, 
why you started the chapter with that, because so often in education, we're called upon to emphasize the positive and not the un of things, but you know, what's better. Um, so what benefit did you find in that sort of reflection and how did it lead you to the feedback processes that you use with your learners today? Well, the, um, the reason I started that way was because it's my impression that most students, all students maybe, and most teachers, maybe all teachers are not really happy with grading, right? And we kind of suppress our awareness that this is wrong, dangerous, arbitrary, a waste of time, you know, all the sort of negative reactions that we might have to grading because we feel like we can't get out of it. And so we can get out of it. I'm glad to talk about that later, all the different ways we can get out of it. But um, I thought a good way to start that would be um, the idea that, that you know you want to get out of it. You know, if you like grading, if you want to keep on grading, you're going to keep on grading. But um, it's very helpful, I think, to open yourself up to all those memories, maybe even going back, like for me to first grade, about what you think is wrong with grading. And you do see an intergenerational, like Stockholm syndrome, where people who have come to schooling before they were old enough to have boundaries, but had the system work for them, essentially turn around and replicate that. I went through it, and so must you. I think maybe you might see that with teachers. I honestly haven't done this exercise a lot with teachers. So I, I don't know what people say, but with my students, when we do a growth mindset exercise and they reflect on grades and grading every semester, I read stories in their blogs that are just heartbreaking. I mean, truly terrible things that happen to them as a result of a grade they got. Um, maybe the teacher realized that that harm was done, but I think in a lot of cases, the teacher had no idea, you know, what the student was thinking and the effect that it had on them. Um, so if you haven't done an exercise like that with your students, brace yourselves because really they're probably going to make you cry. It's uh, grading is a really intense business for students and they have a lot to say about it. I think some of your students are here, right? They signed up, David. Is that right? They, they are. They're, they're joining us today. And actually, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because this is a living process for me personally. With my students, we are going to take in everything that comes up today. We are reading selections from ungrading. And starting tomorrow, we're going to have some discussions and make some agreements about how we'd like the rest of the semester to run. And I will be continuing to update all of you on that process as well, because it's going to be discovery for me too. Thank you for that. Our third panelist is Jesse Stommel. Um, Jesse, when I was getting to know your background, I, Marshall McLuhan had this one, everybody knows the medium is the message, but my personal favorite from him is Anyone who tries to make a meaningful distinction between education and entertainment doesn't really know the first thing about either one. And I'm curious about how your background in media and critical theory informs your work, especially in ungrading. Um, when I was a graduate student at UCLA, Peter McLaren was a member of my advisory committee. And when I think about schooling as a ritual performance, the language that we use, the understandings and identities that we develop, the power relationships between teachers and students, I wonder how, as a filmmaker and a storyteller, you were drawn to address the invisible power structures in schooling, uh, what you called in ungrading the elephant in the room. Um, hi, it's nice to be with you all. Um, I'm really excited that you asked that question because it's surprisingly one I've never been asked before. In some ways, I feel like I had to make a decision at a certain point in my career to focus almost exclusively on higher education pedagogy and to some degree that my earlier work has um, been superseded or over 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 something overwritten by that but I, I definitely think that there's a way that they intersect so I started um, as a teacher I was teaching in two related fields. I was teaching in composition and I was teaching in um, film, film studies. And the course that I taught the most early in my career was film theory. And, um, I, and I loved teaching film theory. And it was actually a, a, a kind of course that was really important to have ungraded. I've been ungrading basically since I, since I came out of the womb. Um, I've been on grading. As long as I've been teaching, I actually can say that I've never put a grade on a student, a piece of student work in my career. Um, it, it felt really important in a course like that, in a course like film theory, where students are reading things that I've read 12 times and still don't understand. Yeah. And it felt really important for the course to be a sandbox, for it to be a playground. 
and for it to be a space of, of not only not being able to get anything wrong, but actually of valorizing the getting of wrong and getting of wrong and getting of wrong until you finally maybe get it right, but then change your mind. Um, and so I would say that that's really important. The other thing that I would say that I'm influenced by is um, the idea of thinking about the fourth wall and thinking about when in film the fourth wall gets broken and the punctum at that moment when the fourth wall gets broke, broke and, and how that's the moment when you're watching a film where you just sort of finally understand what the difference between the world of the film is and the world that you live in and the point at which suddenly you recognize that film is not just about a narrative or a story being told on a screen but that it's actually about you and that you're implicated and it's telling a story about you and that you actually have a hand in that story as the watcher of film. And that's something that I do to this day with students. I'm constantly moving to a meta level. I'm constantly having a conversation with students and then backing up and saying, wait, why are we having this conversation? Why did I have us have this conversation on this particular day? And sometimes I have answers for that, but more often I don't because because really what I want is I want students to be thinking about sort of all the tacit assumptions that we make about why our conversation traveled or flowed the way it did. And so when, so a big piece of my courses is having students thinking about process and thinking about not just the process of producing work, but really thinking about their learning process. Ultimately, I don't, I've learned over the course of my career that I don't really care that much about the products that students make or create that I care more about us thinking about their process and that ultimately that's what I think school is about. It's the moment in our lives where we get to produce things, certainly, mm -hmm. but where in our producing of the thing, we get to sit and, and really kind of sit right down in our process and get to do that with, with other people, a social learning experience, and also get to do that with mentors. So I don't really see my role as thinking about students' products. Um, instead, I think about it really as engaging with them at that meta level where we're reflecting on our own learning. And, and for me, that has to mean bringing myself and myself as a learner to that. Well, thank you for that. And I love asking a question that you haven't been asked before because I know that you're asked a lot. In fact, I also understand that you've got an upcoming event at ASU with a mentor of yours. And I'd like to invite you to start talking about that in the context of a question I'd like to ask all of you. What are your influences? Who are the mentors and what are the models that influenced your work as opposed to say, the traditional teacher credential program that says everything happens in lockstep and in order and is the product of scientific management or behaviorist psychology? What were your influences? And I'm thinking about the labor contracts, I'm thinking about feedback, and any other philosophical or pedagogical influences that you think might be worth sharing. Well, yeah, maybe I'll just, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Laura. Well, I'll just jump in with a shout out for an amazing program at UC Berkeley called Democratic Education at Cal. Uh, which is a program that's been around since the 1970s and it was inspired by the work of Paulo Freire and they use the loophole of uh, independent study, student independent study, so that students organize their own courses for credit, for independent study credit, and you just needed a faculty sponsor to sign off on that. Um, and for me, that was just amazing as an undergraduate student that we could take charge of our education and fill in the gaps in the curriculum based on what we wanted to study and what we could learn and teach one another. And so I was forever ruined by that because I thought that's how all school should be. Um, so if you go online, you can find DECAL is still going strong at Berkeley. So it's been around for a very long time. So anybody who thinks, you know, progressive education ideas are just kind of weird and unsustainable, there's some sustainability for you at Berkeley. And at the end of my chapter in the ungrading book, I talked about John Hurst, an amazing educator who founded the DECAL program. And the story I tell in that chapter is that he was committed to getting rid of grades, but of course he couldn't because he had to turn in grades at the end of the semester. So he insisted on giving every student an A. That was his solution to the problem. And I think that's a very creative solution to ungrading too. If I weren't an adjunct faculty member, I probably would have gone that route myself. Anyway, at Berkeley, they got so mad at him, but he was a tenured faculty member that they took away his right to give grades. He wasn't allowed to give ABCDF anymore. He could only give P 
PNP grades, which I thought was fantastic, right? They thought they were punishing him, but they were actually freeing him from the burden of giving grades and he could only give PNP grades. So I'm a fan of PNP. I'm a fan of John Hurst, Dearly Departed, and of DeKalb at Berkeley. So those are my influences. Aaron or just next? Go. Yeah, I'll go next. Um, so I grew up, um, you know, in the 80s and I listened to punk rock music. I was heavily influenced by Pink Floyd. And of course, The Wall was one of those songs that just has always resonated me uh, and within me. And as a teacher, I did not want to create bricks in the wall. Um, but one of the most influential people that I had in my life was my um, was my principal who had just moved away uh, this this year. Um, he hired me and he really believed in me. And the way he worked with me as, uh, as in our professional relationship was very much the way that I wanted to work with my students. Um, he was very much about building relationships, about me setting my own personal goals as a teacher, and then having conversations about how do I achieve those goals. So I would say my, my principal, John Schaup, has been one of the greatest influences mixed with my anti-establishment background growing up in the 80s. Um, I also grew up in the 80s and I'm not certain that I can pull Madonna lyrics out and use them as an influence on my teaching, but she probably has. Um, my, so if I think about my earliest mentors, in a sense, my philosophical mentors, Paulo Freire and Bell Hooks work have, are just sort of uh, like, they're all over my work and have influenced it a great deal. Um, I can think of my early teaching mentors in, in college, uh, Martin Bickman and R.L. Widman, who both taught me so much about who I am as a teacher. I kind of grew up as a teacher co-teaching with people. From my very first term as a teacher, I was co-teaching. And I've done some variation of co-teaching almost every year of my teaching career because it, it is such a fruitful way for me to think about and reflect on my teaching. And so it means really those conversations, um, particularly with RL, helped, helped me become who I am. Um, I, I like contemporary mentors, I would say a Salbi Inui, who is, was also linked to in the chat. His work on contract grading is, is super valuable to me. Kathy Davidson's work um, it has been super influential to me. My co-author, Sean Michael Morris, who wrote An Urgency of Teacher, Teachers with me, he's someone I've co-taught with more than anyone else and has been just guided my career. Sometimes we don't know where my sentences begin and his, his end. Um, and then I would also say that my parents, uh, so my mom is a domestic violence treatment counselor and she led uh, treatment groups for ma male domestic violence offenders. And I got to hear about her work and think about her work. And her, there's so much pedagogy involved in leading these men's groups. And she really led these men's groups um, using a kind of peer-driven model uh, where the men were trying to learn from each other and fumbling through becoming good people. And I mean, certainly it, it didn't always work, but it was really fascinating to watch her process and her approach. And then my dad was a drug and alcohol treatment administrator, and he created therapeutic treatment communities in the Colorado prison system. And so he would create therapeutic treatment communities uh, for prisoners who would essentially make, uh, grow all of their food, make all of their food. They would become these therapeutic communities where they would structure they would structure the community and also sort of structure their treatment. And so I learned a great deal um, from both of them. And I think they, they've influenced my pedagogy quite a bit. Wonderful, thank you to all three of you for that. So the next question is, is sort of a two tiered question. Um, you know, when I think about movies and narratives, and by the way, I'm also a product of the 70s and 80s, and I, you have me thinking about songs all throughout that in movies. But when I think about my favorite stories, there's usually a personal, situation or conflict that's set against the backdrop of something that's more major, something more out there, something less influenceable. And in the current environment, you know, I'll read something like, uh, and I know it was in Professor Buck's Twitter feed somewhere or the, or the ungrading book chat, but there was a respondent who called a lot of this, I think the exact term, uh, and forgive me, was hippie bullshit. 
And when I see people respond to ungrading or to anything innovative or what they might label progressive or what they might associate with the, oh, the process, touchy feely based humanity stuff. I see it against the backdrop of culture that started about a hundred years ago, or maybe a little bit more with things like uh, Lewis Terman adopting the IQ test and making it something into Alfred Binet never intended, or uh, the people who brought standardized testing to the military and then brought it to the Northeastern colleges and universities. And all of this basis in biological determinism that basically said, we're gonna use tests and associated labels to divide people and stamp them as either acceptable or not acceptable for society, as worthy of opportunity or not. And somewhere along the way, the numbers and the grading got so important that with the advent of technology, uh, may rest in peace, David Graeber, the author of Bullshit Jobs, commented on how the teaching profession was becoming more of a clerkship and an accountancy. And I'm wondering, having said all of that and giving us lots of notes for the, for the list later on, if when you talk to people about what you do, and I know in your presentations, we're going to get to some of the, the nuts and bolts of how we do this, but when you talk to people and they express sentiments about academic rigor or uh, any like-minded philosophies, what's your immediate response and how do you facilitate an empathetic conversation that supports some connection and understanding without giving up on your position? You mind if I go first? Not at all. Okay, so you know, getting back to the idea that uh, ungrading is a bunch of uh, hippie bullshit, um, let's put it this way. Um, you know, really grading is uh, very much a corporate idea. It is about ranking, sorting. Uh, it's basically a capitalist system, which is relatively new. Teaching and learning has been around ever since human beings have been around. And teaching and learning has always been about relationship and conversation. Um, I'd like to say that, uh, that, um, that uh, ungrading is not necessarily progressive, but really regressive and regressive in the sense that we're going back to what is human. Um, grades are not human at all. Me reading a paper and slapping B plus and, uh, and clicking the button and saying, uh, nice job on your work is not human at all. Me sitting down with a student saying, hey, look, I really like the ideas that you have in here. Um, however, some of the structures that you have in here are just not communicating your ideas as well as I think that you want, you're trying to. Um, why don't you try this? That is very much human. And, and to put a grade on something like that just devalues everything that um, I had just done with that student. Um, and so, I, I, I just really push back on the idea when somebody says that um, ungrading is a progressive idea because it's not. It's as, it's, it's as old as teaching and learning is. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I kind of come into it. And I just say, you know, if you really think that what we're currently doing in education is better, then why didn't we use this hundreds and thousands of years ago? I wanna come back to something that Laura was talking about um, after her introduction. She was talking about how it felt for her to be graded. And there's a bit of that in her chapter. And then she also talked about uh, having conversations with her students where they talked about their experiences being graded. When I lead workshops on ungrading, which I've been doing since 2000, 2003, I almost, uh, for the entirety of doing this work, I start them all uh, very close to the same way. I start them with the question, how does it feel to be graded? And how does it feel to grade? Because I actually find that the emotional character of grading is one of the most problematic pieces. There are lots of intellectual problems that I have with standardization and the idea of grades, but I find more than anything, the problem of grades is their emotional character. Because when you have that conversation with students, which I also have, but also with teachers, the feelings that come back are not, they're not small. They're not small feelings, they're intense feelings. Um, the more I hear them, the more I've started to think about grades as a form of abuse, 
Mm -hmm. um, and I don't say that lightly. I'm actually a physical abuse victim. And so the idea of metaphorical abuse, I think is problematic, but I actually think that grades in some cases are a, a form of emotional abuse. And it, when you hear people talk about their experience, um, that has become more and more clear to me. The other question is, how does it feel to grade? And interestingly, there must be teachers out there who love grading. But as long as I've been doing these workshops, I've never had someone say, I love grading. It gives me thrills. It puts chills up my spine. I mean, if you think about the alternative emotions, the sort of having of an epiphany, you know, a chill up my spine, it, it makes my hair stand up on end, like those intense emotions that Laura and I have both he heard the opposite of from students and me from faculty as well. I don't hear those. I don't hear people saying, I'm thrilled every time we get to the end of the semester and I get to put letters and numbers and a 93, when I put that 93.7 on that student, it makes me thrilled. You don't, you don't hear that. And so honestly, starting at that emotional dimension and then moving to the question, well, why do we do it then? Um, and what's, a, what's actually effective about it? And sort of sliding from the emotional trauma of grades to then talking about this, the, the, the fact that most of the research shows that grades, at least in standardized traditional forms, aren't particularly effective, it leads to a question of why, do, why, why are we doing this? And, and why do we feel like we can't stop doing it? Uh, so that's, that, that, that's how I start the conversation and it usually, it, it usually works pretty well. Well, I'll, I'll jump in with a, a part of the question that David asked that is really near and dear to my heart, which is what do you say to people who ask about rigor or what your students do if they're not graded? Um, and, and I just show them, right? So one of the great things about teaching online and having students create things online is that you can show people what the students have done, right? And my whole, whole goal is to help the students become better writers than they were at the start of the semester. You know, it's a process that we engage in. I don't have a specific goal in mind for each student. Instead, I just have this idea that we all engage in a writing process together. We can all become better writers, and that includes me too. And in addition to websites, oh, I can show another book. This is the anthology of microfiction that my students wrote this past fall that we published as a book. You know, because websites are fun to show to people if you can share links, but that book is at anthology.lauragibbs.net. You can see the book, you can get the printed book, it's available as an EPUB, a Mobi, and so I like to do shout outs. I have to give a huge shout out to Pressbooks because I had no idea for years how easy it is to take digital content and make it available in all these different formats, including printed books. So I actually love it when people ask me, well, what do your students do if they're not graded? And I can show them what they do and how they write great stuff and take creative risks. And some of the stories turn out great and some of them don't. You know, it's like what Jesse was saying, it's about the process, not the product. But if you have a good process for 15 weeks and students are writing for 15 weeks, of course they're gonna come up with good stuff. You know, and I have great faith that's gonna happen. I don't have any faith in grades or what they will do. And if I were to show people my grade distribution in the class, they won't have learned anything. But if I show them the work, the actual work that the students do with my help and each other's help, uh, feedback, feedback all the time, um, great things happen. So I like being able to show people what my students are doing and go to anthology.lauragibbs.net. They wrote some great stories and maybe you'll be inspired to try microfiction with your students too, because it's something new for me over the past year. And it's, it's been a game changer for a lot of my students who are reluctant writers. They really get into the microfiction. I love I love just listening to Laura talk with the glee that she that she talks about her work with students and that's that opposite emotion from the sort of the terror or the abuse or the trauma or the anxiety that we feel around grades and to, and most teachers have that um, it's unfortunate to me that grades end up being such a pivotal part in the relationships that we have, both with our institutions, with each other as teachers, and with our students, because the grades end up influencing the very start of that relationship because we talk about them in the syllabus. And so they're one of the first things that students hear and think about. And then it's the last thing that we do with a student when they leave a class. And so all of that sort of glee and that um, sort of joy that Laura is showing is bookended by this, by this bureaucratic component to the relationship. 
You know, Jesse, you're making a really important point about the communication process and, you know, primacy and recency, right? It's the first and the last thing you hear that makes the most lasting impact. And uh, when I talked to my students last year and Laura and I started talking about this in earnest about asynchronous, the word essay is terrifying. It takes on these connotations that are absolutely, you know, there's no really there's no other word for it than traumatic, Jesse, because the kinds of responses I was getting, because I started by asking, what do you think of, what do you feel when you hear or read the word essay? And I was expecting boring. I was expecting, you know, not the fun stuff, but I was not expecting crying, wanting to drop out, not being able to sleep. These were somatic experiences. And it led me to a completely different conversation about what Montaigne meant when he used the word essay and how we're all trying, essaying, to be understood and make ourselves understood and to understand the people around us. And we tossed the rest, forgot five paragraphs and whatever else went into that you know, training and just started trying to understand ourselves and trying to understand each other. And that produced the kind of work that would never have happened otherwise. So I do want to loudly endorse some of the things that you're saying from a very practical standpoint. This all sounds very good to people who are trapped, but it's also once you take that step and you break out of that way of doing things, the results that you get and the experiences and the joy like on Laura's face and to see that from a high school junior or sophomore who's in the process, like I see some of our chat, the kindergartners are having a blast even on Zoom. And kindergartners are awesome. You have one, don't you, for close? And the energy and the chaos and the wonder, and then it goes down every year. There's a wonderful little book called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. And the introduction is a guy who worked for Hallmark Cards and went to schools to do presentations on sculpture. And he would do the assemblies in order of the grades. And he would start every assembly by saying, hey, who here is an artist? And the younger kids were all over it. And the hands went lower and lower and lower every year. So in thinking about this and extrapolating a few years from now, it's not magic wand time, but it is possibly a time when things have heated up just enough so that things have become pliable. California has decided not to administer the SAT, for example. And there's been a lot of traffic in the chat about standardized testing. And we thought we would never see that day. If you could look into the future three to five years and education could have learned things. Uh, Scott McLeod just published an article saying he doesn't think that education is gonna change all that much. And there's a case to be made that things will snap back to the way that people thought they should be before. But what would be different? What should we be learning about this moment given all the challenges people are facing? about ungrading and how that can support more effective learning as we put things back together post pandemic. I think I, to me, one of the keys is people like the four of us, like the people who are joining this coming together and kicking, kicking asses. Um, truthfully, I think that we have work to do. And the one thing that has been so exciting about, well, it's exciting about this book, but it's exciting really about what gave birth to this book, which is really the last five years, where I've been doing this work since 2003. And it's really been in the, uh, the last five years. I mean, I've known Laura well longer than the last five years, but it's been the last five years that I felt like a coalition has started to form of voices coming together. And you really you can't kick ass by yourself, especially if you're precarious, especially given that almost all teachers are working precariously to some degree. Um, and so I guess the thing that I'm excited about is that it isn't necessarily that we have to change the world. Um, it is instead that we have to create space for teachers to make choices about how they wanna do their work and that we can create and help support those choices. And honestly, if I give a talk at an institution, my, I really don't hope that the institution decides to do ungrading, Jesse Stommel's ungrading TM as their model for the entire institution. That's the point at which ungrading breaks. This can't, you know, this doesn't scale that way. 
because teaching is idiosyncratic and this work is deeply idiosyncratic. What can scale is trusting teachers to do the work of teaching and trusting them to make critical decisions about how they do that work. And if what our work does is allow someone to decide, no, I don't wanna use the learning management system because the learning management system is all roads lead to the grade book, all roads lead to and from the grade book. And that's not, that doesn't support my pedagogy. If, it, if, I, if even one teacher can decide to not use the learning management system or decide to use self-reflection and have students grade themselves, that's really the work to me. And it's not necessary, it doesn't need to be global change. I wanna jump onto what uh, Jesse said about the learning management system. Um, a colleague of mine says that the, uh, the grade book um, is uh, basically like the autopsy. Uh, the learning is dead and we're left here trying to figure out what happened. Um, that's, I, I just love that idea. But I would say that the one thing that, that I don't know, if, you know, if we don't change much when we go back to regular in-class teaching, the reason is, I think, is because we ignored the fact that the kids who were disengaged and disenfranchised during online learning, we're just as disengaged and disenfranchised before online learning. And the, we're, a lot of people are still trying to do the same thing that they were doing before COVID hit. And now we're seeing a lot more Fs. I mean, you read the papers and you will see that the number of Fs are through the roof. Um, you know, we did a study in our school and we have, I have like, we have like over 700 students in our school and 350 of our students have at least one F. Um, so what does that say? It says that the kids that were struggling before, yeah, they got some supports and stuff because of they, they were present, but they were disengaged and disenfranchised before. Now they're left to their own devices. And we're gonna continue to have disengaged and disenfranchised students as soon as we return back to um, regular learning. So if we're not making changes to truly engage students and to truly find out what are you interested in and how can I help you to discover who you are in the process, then we're going to continue to, yeah, we're going to be an absolute failure um, going forward. Just practically speaking too about grading during the pandemic, my school was one of many that did PNP grading back in the spring. And um, I was really involved in that kind of PNP pass fail nation movement back in the spring because I thought that was great. You know, I've always been an advocate of PNP, not just for the pandemic, but it was a response that we saw at hundreds, literally hundreds of higher ed schools and it played out in different ways in K through 12, but you saw it there too. And I thought that was just great, you know, because people are going to find out that that PNP is not the end of the world, that that lo and behold, you're going to watch your students. Some of them are going to take NPs and some of them are going to take Ps, but but you won't be thinking about the grades. You'll be thinking about the, the learning and what did they do and, and how well it worked. Well, I, I thought it worked really well and students definitely thought it worked really well but my school announced in the fall that we weren't going to have PNP grading again, even though it was still clearly the pandemic in the fall and things were disrupted and strange in the fall, even more than they had been in the spring. And so the students got together, glory be, and got a petition going at change.org. And they got over 5,000 signatures on this petition. I'd never seen anything like that in my life at my school. And still we didn't have PNP grading. You know, and my school said, oh, well, after much discussion, we have decided that we're not going to have PMP grading. Well, I wasn't in on those discussions. I don't know who was. But one of the things they cited, this was very interesting, a, a, an email circulated by accident. You know, watch out, people, what you put in emails, because emails can be forwarded. Uh, one of the reasons they didn't want to do PMP grading again was because apparently thousands of Bs, letter grade B, had been changed to Ps. And they were very distressed that this had happened because the idea with PNP grading was supposed to be to help students who are in danger of getting a C when they might otherwise not have gotten a C, change it to a P. And all these students had changed these Bs to Ps and they were very distressed at the bureaucratic load that put on things. And that's also not supposed to be how it worked as they saw it. And I guess the, the lesson I wanted everybody to see there is if you had thousands of these B grades 
being changed to P's. That's because students have learned that this is all just a GPA gain, right? So if you have a B and your grade point is anything higher than a 3.0, that B is actually going to bring down your GPA, right? So, so I hadn't even thought about that. I don't think about these things, but obviously the students have. And so they took the opportunity to boost their GPAs by changing their Bs to Ps and so on and so forth. And so one of the things in addition to grading, I think we really need to look at and talk about is the, and I'll say it, the abomination that is the GPA, right? Because grades are bad enough. You can sort of go back and try to dissect the corpse, like Aaron was saying, and figure out what the grade in a course means. Like, what did a student do to get this grade in this course? You can explain it. But if you look at a GPA, this number that's used to define a student and to gatekeep them from getting into future employment or future education, you can't even really explain it in normal human terms, why that person is a 3.18 as opposed to a 2.79 or whatever. So uh, that's something I really hope we see addressed in the future too. You know, they're talking about different ways to do college admissions, graduate school admissions. And in addition to talking about standardized tests, I really hope we talk about the GPA in the future, the work that we're asking it to do and how it is just not up to do that task in a, a fair or equitable or even practical way. And yeah, I just want to follow on that to connect this idea of the GPA to the stress and the emotional character of grades. This is um, from my institution back in um, the spring, my institution where I was teaching and the students came together and wrote a Google Doc arguing for pass, some version of pass, no pass as their, as their grades. The Google Doc ended up becoming something like 50 pages and I did some textual analysis on the Google Doc and lo looked for the different appearances of different words. And I found that the word stress appeared 41 times. The word struggle appeared 37 times. The word worry appeared 26 times. Mental health appeared 30 times. Anxiety, 10 times. But then the most heartbreaking piece for me was that the word, that the word or the, the acronym GPA appeared 52 times. So the coral, and I wish I had done a little bit more correlative work because I, as just re reading the document, the word GPA sat alongside these words, stress, struggle, mental health, worry, access, anxiety. Um, so it's both a kind of currency um, in our system, but it also, it, it's, doing, it's doing harm. And so I, I second Laura's, let's chop that thing. Wow, I would love to see that analysis uh, in greater detail because it jives right with what I was describing at the high school level with the students about the word essay and then consequently about how that translated into them sensing themselves. Um, this is a really good segue and a good time for us to transition into the presentations I knew that you had prepared. So Aaron, would you like to uh, walk us through your stuff first and then Laura and then we'll have Jesse? Yeah, so let me go ahead and launch. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about why should we go gradeless and uh, some little bit of ways that you can go gradeless. Uh, so, um, anyways, so as uh, David shared, I am a high school English teacher, 2019 State Teacher of the Year nominee, um, Washington State English Fellow five-time golf coach of the year, co-founder of Teacher Girl Gradeless and host of the um, podcast Beyond Curriculum. And one of the things I'm really proud of is my contribution to Spectrum Life magazine or Spectrum's magazine, used to be called Spectrum Life, which is a uh, magazine for the advocacy of families and people with autism. Um, so why should we go gradeless? Um, the problem with traditional grades and grading is that grades do not communicate learning. They were never intended to. They were intended to rank and sort. And so um, in, when they were first established, it was like, well, okay, who's the highest, who's the lowest? And it, it turned into becoming something in the Industrial Revolution where who's going to, uh, who could do calculus and work as managers at the factory and who can't do calculus and who's going to be the workers in the factory. So it was all about ranking and sorting. Um, there are also extrinsic rewards which demotivate risk-taking and intellectual tasks. So um, Daniel Pink has shared some studies about how um, in, when, when 
monetary rewards are offered for intellectual tasks, especially when those tasks are challenging, we give up. But when the task is for the joy of completing the task, we will work on it until um, we, we desire to. And he asked the question, why is it that people will spend hours and hours and hours on their own working to, uh, to, to, to learn to play the guitar when it doesn't earn them any money? Whereas we'll give up on um, writing an essay, as we keep hearing this term, um, when there's a grade attached to it. Um, it decreases learning and engagement. And I'm going to get into that a little bit. Uh, the problem with standards-based grading, because this has been a big shift over the last uh, several years, is a move to standards-based grading. And one of the biggest problems with that is that SB, uh, SBG limits education. And what I mean by that is it limits what the scope is. So we create these, um, these boxes that describe here is what is excelling, and here is what is um, developing, and here's what's meeting standard. And if it doesn't fit in the box, then where do you lie? And so taking risks is actually um, uh, looked down upon in standards-based grading because if you take risk, you won't fit into a box. Um, they facilitate data mining. Um, really what standards-based grading is about is about figuring out where your kids are uh, deficient so that we can buy more products so that we can continue to develop them and not make a difference in their lives really because really standards-based grading is about that. Um, Standards-based grading, grading limits students' desire to achieve. Um, you know, students want nothing more than to discover who they are and where they're placed in the world. But standards-based grading says, here's where you have to be, and this is the things that you have to learn, and this is the order that you have to learn them. And so when we develop standards-based grading, it is completely about somebody else's call uh, somebody else who, li who lives far away from us, who wears a suit, who thinks they know better than us, telling us what we need to know. It's not about the student. It's not about the learner. It's not about the community at all. So those are some of the problems I see with standards-based grading. So I love the idea of learning to ride a bike. When I taught my kids how to ride a bike, they, they were excited. Actually, my oldest was excited. My youngest wasn't. Um, but there was a sense of excitement about as they developed learning the bike um, that they, they were going to develop this freedom in, and they were growing up and they were gaining a skill that they knew was going to be invaluable to them. But it was fun. Um, there was a purpose. They knew that once they learned how to ride a bike, they could go ride with their friends. They could get away from the house. They could go to the park. They could go to the store. They could go do all these things. But while riding the bike, they got a lot of feedback, both from me and from the ground that they hit when they crashed. Um, and this feedback told them that they were doing things incorrectly um, and how to do things more correctly along the way. And when I was teaching my kids how to ride a bike, we videotaped it because it was fun. Um, it was all about showing the world what my kids were accomplishing. And so I feel like learning to ride a bike is a metaphor for how we should be teaching in our classrooms. I never gave my kids a grade once while they were riding the bikes. And in all honesty, I think it would have destroyed them if I had said, hey, you know what? You know, you crashed multiple times today. I'm going to give you a C plus, giving that plus because you tried really hard, but mm, no, we're not quite there yet. We'll get you there though. So how do grades impact learning? Well, there was a study back in 1987 by Ruth Butler in which she took a bunch of students and she said, okay, we're going to take some that get comments only, some that get grades only, some that get praise only, and some who receive no feedback. Well, as you can see, if we look at the starting point and the finishing point, we can see that those who received comments only uh, grew astronomically. However, those who received grades only, actually decreased. Those who, grew, who received praise only decreased more than, uh, about the same as those who received grades. And those who received no feedback at all decreased the most. Well, she did the study again, but she wanted to look at the impact of grades and comments because, well, there was this argument, well, if we put grades and comments together. And the interesting thing is comments only, again, grew astronomically. Grades only decreased. 
but grades and comments actually decreased even more than the grades only. So one of the questions that I'm constantly asked is, if I don't give grades, will my learners know how they're doing? Well, I think, and it was, you know, I shared with you guys that I'm a golf coach too. I've been coaching golf for 16 years and I've learned more about teaching out on the golf course than I have ever in any, um, in any pedagogy uh, book or class or lecture. Um, um, and so what I've learned is good teaching is like good coaching. Uh, as a coach, we need to establish a purpose, a why statement. Why are we here on the golf course or why are we here within what we're doing? Um, and, and if you're not familiar with the work of Simon Sinek, I highly recommend watching his, uh, his TED Talk. It's the number one um, watch TED Talk of all time. Um, but also a coach understands their content and they know how to teach it. So as being a good golf coach, I need to understand the game of golf. I need to understand the swing and I need to understand the mental, um, uh, that the mental game that the kids need to go through in order to be competitive. Um, they understand the uniqueness of their learners and develop their, um, their, 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 their structure around that. And so I need to know this kid is strong at this, but weak at this. And this, this one is strong at this one, but weak at that. And it really helps me to identify what I can do to help my um, athletes on an individual basis, but also pair them up with athletes who can help each other and work with each other. Um, they prepare their learners to showcase their work. Um, we're constantly thinking about getting into those games and preparing for those games. And mostly, how do we get into that postseason and compete at the highest level at postseason? We want, and one of the things that I always tell my parents, matter of fact, we just started the golf season on Monday, and I'm going to be doing my parent orientation tonight, and I'm going to be telling my parents, I expect you to come out and watch your kid play, because I don't want them to miss that great shot that they, that they made on the fourth hole after blowing up on the hole before. I want them to see these things. And so I, I, uh, in, in, a good teacher is going to wanna showcase the work as well. We make learning challenging, fun, and meaningful. Um, you know, we, as a golf coach, we play games. We do mini competitions, but all these mini competitions are meant to challenge my athletes and see how to develop as an athlete. Um, we develop personal character. What we do in the, on the golf course is all about developing uh, individual character, individual responsibility, and become a better person. And good coaches know the impact that they make on the lives of the learner. Well, oops, excuse me. Um, so that's what a good teacher does as well. Um, so somehow I skipped a slide. Nope, I didn't. Okay. So how do we do all this? Well, we have to provide rich feedback. And as a golf coach, I give both, I give a lot of oral feedback. Um, and sometimes I'll even send text messages to my athletes about some of the things that I saw throughout their game. But as a good teacher, we want to give written, verbal, audio recordings of feedback, video recordings of feedback, tap into multi uh, facets of feedback. Uh, one of my favorites is SE2R, which is summarize, explain, redirect, and resubmit. Um, so some examples of summarizing. Hey, I noticed you provided several pieces of research to your work, uh, to your project that will help build a strong argument. Uh, but can you add any citations in there? You know, we want to make sure that we have citations. Uh, we want to explain citations, uh, citing sources is important because it gives credit where credit is due. And it can help your reader to learn more about uh, the topic by visiting your sources. So I want you to go back and add your sources. Do you know how to do this? And if they say yes, go do it. If not, okay, well, here's how you do that. And once you're done, I want you to resubmit your work. I look forward to your revisions. Now, one of the things that, that traditional grading would do is, well, you didn't add your sources, so you get a B minus. Um, well, you know, if citing sources is important, then why are we acknowledging the fact that it's okay to turn in work that doesn't have sources in it? No explain to them how to do it. Maybe they didn't know how to do it. Maybe they didn't realize the importance of it. Whatever it is, it's our job as good teachers to um, make sure that they understand that this is something that's important. And we're gonna hold them accountable to do these important things. Um, I love using single point rubrics. Now I use them less and less as I teach because I can give better feedback 
without going to this form. But I do use single point rubrics as kind of like a, a, a list of what are some of the general expectations for something. Um, a single point rubric can develop a, a single set of standards for all students. And so if you're um, like, this one is one for a uh, project for my mythology class, they need to introduce the, the, the topic of what they're gonna be dealing. They need to tell the story um, of the myth and they need to provide some analysis and a conclusion. Well, these are expected in a blog post uh, for um, uh, their mythology. And these can be teacher created or they can be co-created. And I co-create single point rubrics with my students all the time. There are things that I want my students to be able to do. And so I add my expertise into it, but then I will solicit them. What else needs to be in here? And one of the things that they came up with with this one is they felt that conventions were important. And I absolutely agree with them. And um, they, they felt that uh, adding some graphics into their blog posts was important too. So I added that into this for them. Um, and the nice thing about a single point rubric is we co-created this, we knew the expectations of this. And so now when we check your work, we make sure that you've met all the criteria. And if you haven't, well, use the SE2R, go back and do this until we get there. And so I can highlight strengths and weaknesses. It's not a matter of, I have these um, pre-prescribed ideas of what excellent is, and I can just put a color in the four circle or box. Um, now I can just look at a student's work and go, wow, I really appreciate how you developed this area. This was really insightful. And I want to see more of this type of insight into your work. Or, um, hey, you know, um, you really didn't fully develop this area. Here's some ideas on how we can fully develop it or even ask them questions. What are some things that you were trying to communicate? And those could be within the concerns. So, um, so how are stakeholders going to know how our, how our learners are doing? And this is a big question because our community, our parents, our community are really investing into um, education and they want to make sure that as teachers that we're helping our, prepare our students for the, the, the greater world and, and be able to engage in the greater world. Ooh, just don't know what happened. There we go. So... One of the things that I love is um, uh, Iris Sokol uh, calls it P-based learning and then not just limiting to project-based. We have project-based, problem-based or place-based learning. Um, and it starts with a question and ends with a solution. So project-based learning is generally um, some form where we ask a question and we try to solve a real world problem. And often that solution is publicly shown. Um, we did a project in my class, which is mentioned in the chapter that I wrote, where we addressed concerns that are going on in our school. And I had students create um, uh, programs for anti-bullying campaigns that were student created, anti-drug campaigns. I even had a, a group of young ladies um, develop because uh, we had the, uh, the, the, the hygiene products in the bathroom for a quarter and they were a one size fits all. And so they said, no, this is not right. First of all, why are we even charging? Because nobody carries money. And B, these products are not good for anybody. So they ended up putting a campaign together where they got a basket in the girls' bathrooms that have a variety of products. And um, we have a women, uh, women's activist club at our school who takes care of these, um, but it's fully funded by the school. So. That's project-based learning, which also ties into problem-based learning, where we identify a problem that's going on. Um, that would have actually been that example I gave you is more of a problem-based learning, where we identify a problem and we find solutions to those. And again, it's about finding those solutions and presenting those solutions as uh, ways to engage within the community. There's place-based learning. Um, this is something that has become new to me over the last year, and, and how I'm using it is um, we're actually doing a project in my freshman class where my, my students are going to be um, finding out about their community and the history of their community. And so we're going to be reaching out to people within our community and doing a podcast series, um, which is just developing the history of Woodland, not from a textbook standpoint, but from the people who have experienced the history of Woodland, people who are um, involved in building the dike up river or uh or or you know the salmon that's in our community or the wood the wood industry uh, and so forth so these this is about learning about your community and how our community was 
fulfilled. So that's place-based learning. But they all start with a question and it provides students ownership, the ability to be creative, to collaborate with each other and critical thinking skills. And these are all things that can be publicly shown. Um, just like my golfers will go out and play a match and, and they'll compete. These are things the community are going to see when we're done with these. We wanna put our, our kids work on display. Uh, one of the things I'm really trying to push in my school is having a showcase night at the end of the year. Um, instead of doing these parent-teacher conferences at the end of the year where I'm sitting, um, and these are okay, where the student is leading the conference and going, here's the work that I've done. I'd rather have the community come in with our students work on display. And one of the things that I find that it'll do is teachers who are not displayed, let students choose what they wanna display. And teachers who are not displaying work are gonna feel this burn, like, well, I need to figure out what I'm doing wrong so that I can get my work displayed. Um, but that's gonna, but in doing something like this, it's gonna build a connection between the school and the community. And schools that are doing um, showcase nights and inviting the community to, to, to see what kids can do, um, they're developing relationships with the local businesses. Um, they're developing, they're, the, you know, if your community is uh, reliant on taxes, local taxes, to fund the school, well, this community is gonna see what's going on and be more likely to want to vote for those bonds and levies. Um, we need to do student created portfolios. I, I think the worst thing is for a teacher to sit down in isolation and put a grade on something at the end of the semester. Students need a say and they need to be, be able to show what they're proud of. And there's a couple that are great. There are these isolated ones such as um, like, uh, uh, Oh gosh, I can't remember what they're called. Um, uh, oh, Seesaw and so forth, which I have on the left here. But on the right is the mastery transcript, which is both teacher and student created. Um, and students contribute uh, work that they have done. And these can be printed up and published as a portfolio going into college, going into the career field or whatever they want to do beyond high school. So, a lot of us don't have the leisure of um, avoiding grades at the end of the semester. Boy, I wish that I was P and P, um, but I do have to report a grade and most educators do at some point have to report a grade. So how will I report a grade if I go with something like this? And so I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of working as, as in teachers going grade list to see a number of ways that we can do that. And one way that we could do it is select and support. And this is, I actually use in my freshman class, um, is we'll have a set of criteria. Uh, and one of the things that I wanna see in my freshmen is a level of engagement. I want them to engage and try and take and participate. I want them to, um, to be mindful of their work and work towards a quality level that they feel is the best quality they can do. And I want them to be open to criticism, both from me and their peers, and be able to show levels of growth. And so I have a simple um, you know, rubric here where students just identify themselves within here and they can select and, and support their grade. And a lot of educators are using this. Another way, which um, I'm using now with my, my, my seniors is grading contracts. And um, grading contracts, uh, you know, Saubi, Inouye, he has been a proponent of this, uh, and it really takes out the idea of, um, of the teacher having control, but puts more of control into the student's hands. And some of our students are, we gotta be honest, teachers, um, some students are just not interested in our content area and are taking the class because they have to earn the credit. And we have to be okay with that. And if that's all they want to do, and they wanna get the C grade or whatever, then let them. Um, now, there are multiple ways to do this. Uh, Anoy would argue that, um, that you know, the teacher should not create certain criteria for it. Um, I kind of think that, I believe that, you know, the world is gonna expect a certain level of, of, of excellence within a work in order, to be, in order for it to be taken seriously. Um, so I kind of would push for going back to the single point rubrics with something like this and co-create that with your students. So they have a voice in what is gonna go into, um, into the work that they commit to and the grade that they're going to get at the end. Um, and really in uh, Sao Bianoi would argue that labor is learning. The more you do something, the more you're going to learn. 
So in a grading contract like this, you could say if you do six out of six entries, um, you're going to learn more than somebody who only does three out of six entries. It's pretty, you know, it's just it. I mean, my athletes who, um, my athletes who, oh, that keeps going backwards. My athletes who spend more time after and before practice working on the range are the ones that are going to be competing at a higher level at the district and state tournaments. The ones that show up for practice and, and leave their clubs in the garage after the season's done, they're going to be okay. They're going to learn the game of golf and they're going to be all right with that. And I've got to be okay with that. So that is essentially why we, sh you know, why should we go gradeless and some ideas on how we can go gradeless. And uh, I would say, I, I noticed that there was a question in the Q&A asking, how do we uh, do this in, in areas like, um, let me stop sharing my screen. And how do we do this in areas like STEM or mathematics? Well, think about it. How are people using mathematics outside of the four walls of your school? How are people using um, science outside the four walls of your school? And then, Teach your kids to be able to use science, mathematics in ways that it's being used outside of the school. So, you know, if your community like mine has a river that runs through right in the middle of your community and you have a series of dams and in Washington, we get a lot of rain. But one of the big questions is when do we let the dams, when do we let the levees go and potentially flood the community? Or when do we let it build up really high up river and flood up river? It's a huge question. And you could ask your students to solve these types of problems in a mathematics class and make proposals to, um, cause that's gonna be, uh, you know, growth and so forth. Um, and make these proposals to your city councils or whatever. Um, but yeah, ask them these challenging questions that mathematicians are dealing with. Ask them these questions that scientists are dealing with and let, and, and Let's see where they can go with these things, because maybe our young people discover something within themselves and they could be the, the changers of this world. Thank you so much, Aaron. I hear a theme today of authenticity and integrity. Uh, and I don't mean integrity just in the sense of being honest, but in integrating lived experiences. Uh, I see connections with things like heritage language. I see connections with things like um, I learned this past year that, you know, in my community, many of our students are uh, of Central American and Mexican heritage, and much of what we know about Mesoamerican indigenous cultures comes from journals that were created during a pandemic 500 years ago. So in the co-creation of the curricular experience, and I saw this uh, with Laura's uh, Tiny Tales as well, the students are producing not just the demanded artifacts from a standardized textbook, but in creating all of this, the students are actually documenting their own learning in real time. And I love the way that you presented that. Thank you so much. Uh, Laura and Jesse, do you have any follow-ons to Aaron's while it's fresh? Or Laura, would you just like to jump in with yours? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in and I'll just say I'm not a presenter type of person. I sometimes call myself the queen of asynchrony. I don't have a lot of Zoom tolerance and thinking about people's Zoom tolerance. Actually, what I'm going to do is just tell you what I prepared for this because it's really more an explore it on your own kind of thing. Um, I'm not even going to do the screen share. I'll just let you explore. Just go to teaching.lauragibbs.net in your own browser. That's better than looking at my browser because then you can bookmark it. What I did was to create a, just a blog post that has links to my approach to ungrading, which I've tried to document in detail, but more importantly, 10 years worth of student comments on this process. And when I tell you that I've never gotten negative feedback from students about the process, I'm not kidding, right? So I teach gen ed courses, wide range of students, wide range of interests. Their feedback has been so useful to me in terms of refining the process, but also just so encouraging. So I made a little randomizer thing that pops up just at random from this like heaps of comments, the things that students have said about grading and ungrading, uh, the things that they've said about creativity, because I think creativity is incredibly important, not just in writing, but across all these fields, just like Aaron was talking about creative 
question asking and creative problem solving, and then also what students say about freedom. And so what I do every semester is when I get the end of course evaluations, I just go through and I just look for those words, grades, grading, free, freedom, create, creativity, and I save well, Laura, all I apologize for the I apologize for the interruption. We have some uh, attendees who didn't quite catch the link. Can you oh, share? Oh, can someone put it in the chat for me? It's teaching.lauragibbs.net. I'm just a Zoom doofus. But if you look at it, what happens is every time you look at that post, you can reload it as many times as you want. Random student comments will come up. And one thing that I noticed when I was playing with it last night and setting it up is how often students talk about me being so fast with the grading. And I don't put grades on anything, right? I just give them feedback, lots of feedback. But and I was trying to think, how can we, what's an analogy to that situation? And I decided it's kind of like the way we say to dial a phone number, right? Now, there have been dials for a long time, right? I remember dials on the phones, like when I was in maybe fifth grade or sixth grade. It's been a long time since we dialed phones, but we still talk about dialing phone numbers. And I think what's going to happen with grades and grading is even as we get away from it, it's so penetrated our vocabulary of teaching and learning that we're going to have people talking about feedback as grading. So when you do see student comments and they're saying Laura is so fast with grading, what they mean is Laura is fast with giving feedback on the projects. And so I, uh, like I said, I'm not going to do a presentation because I hope we have time for questions, but I try to document all my work openly online and you can find my students work and you can ask me questions at Twitter because really it's like Jesse said there's not a Laura Gibbs TM approach to things if my approach helps other people that's great but my favorite thing is just to brainstorm with people about say a problem you've run into trying to ungrade and see if there's some solution I can help you think of so I'm not going to do a presentation I'm just going to say there's that stuff teaching.lauragibbs.net should take you to it and um listen to what my students say, right? Their enthusiasm. If you want a reason to trust students, one of my favorite Twitter hashtags, trust students, just look at what they say. They wanna learn, they wanna create, they wanna share, they wanna work, they wanna take risks, they wanna do all those things. They want to do it and grades prevent them from doing that. Get rid of the grades and they'll do all these great things. I, I just wanna jump in and I, I am going to present, but very briefly, um, Aaron is our headliner. And thank you so much for that presentation, Aaron. Uh, I, I want to jump in and respond to something that Laura was talking about, about the way that how, how much grades are baked into our system. And I'm looking specifically at the, um, the course evaluation form that students fill out for University of Mary Washington, where I ta taught for many years. And I'm looking at the questions and the way that the questions are written and how these questions and the way that they're written then influence the student, the feedback students give. And there are six questions about the instructor. And I'm just gonna read you these six questions, um, the our little short versions of them. The first one is the instructor regularly taught and provided content as appropriate. The instructor presented course material in an organized manner. The instructor was enthusiastic about the course material. So of the six, Three of them are not about grades. The other three are all about grades. And I just want to listen, have us listen to the phrasing. Number, uh, question four, the instructor provided clear criteria for grading. If I think about that question and I think about what that assumes about our teacher, I actually don't provide clear criteria about grading. I put that in the hands of students they determine the criteria for the grading. I use self-evaluation and self-reflection. So this is in some ways irrelevant to me and my approach altogether, but it's interesting the assumptions it makes. The next one is the instructor provided feedback about my performance suitable to the nature of the class. I don't actually provide feedback about people's performance. Again, I'm interested in process. Performance suggests the thing they perform, and even just the word performance is a fascinating word, but it does suggest their performance of a product or their performance to my expectations. I don't think it's, I don't think they mean that word in Aaron's golfing, you know, I don't, I think that you could use the word performance there and he could probably give 
uh, nuanced feedback about it, but I don't think that that's what they're really implying. And then the sixth question is the instructor graded or evaluated assignments within a reasonable amount of time. Laura would probably perform really well on that one. Um, but actually the truth is that people who ungrade tend to get lower, um, F, uh, lower course evaluations on questions like these. So people often ask, well, how does this affect your course evaluations? Honestly, it makes everything that's not about grades go up. It usually makes everything that is about grades go down because of the wording of the questions. And that's again, idiosyncratic to the institution. Um, I'll, I'll stop there and I'm gonna share, share screen and I just have a few slides and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. So I, I just wanted to pop up the questions that I use. These are the questions that I use for workshops, which I referred to easy, uh, earlier. The other question on here that it ends up being really central to the discussion is this first one, who is assessment for? That's the kind of question that can really break open a conversation about how, why, when we do assessment. Because usually the answer to that question is, well, it's for a lot of people and we could list the people it's for. It's for students, it's for the institution, it's for the instructor. As Aaron pointed out, it's for other stakeholders, it's for the future employers, it's for accrediting bodies, it's for um, graduate school admissions committees. But ultimately you then ask, well, who is it who is it most important that we do this assessment for? And the answer is usually students. Most people want the assessment to primarily be for students. And if we're primarily making it for students, I think we would make it entirely different than we currently make it. Um, so my thesis, my thesis for this, and it's actually kind of become my thesis for all of my teaching. I, I did an experiment years ago where I asked people to write their forward pedagogies at hashtag forward pedagogy. Um, and if someone wants to put that out, it's spelled out F-O-U-R if you want to put that in the chat. But there's thousands of these now, these forward pedagogies. And so I, I started this experiment off with with my own, which was start by trusting students. And it's really become a mantra for me. And it's been something that I hold up against almost all of my other teaching practices. To what degree am I living up to this idea of starting by trusting students? Um, I, I mostly, I, I, I am a, uh, as it says on my Twitter profile, an irascible optimist. That is a uh, moniker that was given to me by Sean Michael Morris and it's stuck and I have continued and held onto it this day. I will be honest and tell you that in the last year, my optimism has not been nearly as uh, robust. And it is partly, it started, I think really in some of those conversations that Laura was describing about, about students asking for pass, no fat pass, asking for compassionate grading policies, and me seeing both the willingness to pivot and make changes in response to that. But what I've noticed in the last six to nine months is a willingness to just as quickly pivot back to business as usual. And so I, I will tell you that these slides are not my most optimistic slides about ungrading. If you do a Google search for is cheating on the rise, you find a half dozen articles like this one from the Washington Post, which actually cites data reported by ProctorU about the rise of online cheating. I won't share that data, which seems journalistically irresponsible for the Washington Post to turn to a proctoring organization for data about cheating, which the more cheating, the more it helps ProctorU's business model. So I don't certainly don't trust them as a source for um, data about cheating. And, and what we actually find if we look at the data about cheating, in 1963, Bowers surveyed roughly 100 institutions and found that 75% of the surveyed students admitted to cheating at least once in their college careers. The numbers have not changed much since then. McCabe et al's 2012 cheating in college includes findings from 150,000 students recently surveyed showing that between 60 to 70% of respondents admitted to cheating. So if anything, cheating has stayed the same or it has gone slightly down in the last 60 years. Uh, well, those numbers are still quite large. If I think about, well, why have 60 to 70 students reported cheating? In some ways, I feel like our grading and assessment structure, we've, we've built a really great a, a cheating engine, a cheating engine that's being fed on every side. Because if students don't feel intrinsic motivation to do work, then what they're, or if grades are just a currency, then ultimately, 
they want the grades, they want them as quickly as they can get them because they want to spend that currency. And Laura pointed out what happened with the Bs being turned to pass, no pass, because they recognize that it's currency and they recognize that it has a, a sort of translation rate, if you will. And that they essentially, we've built a system that is in some ways designed for students to game. So when we, when I'm, on, I'm often asked, well, you start by trusting students, no grades, won't students take advantage of you? And I think, I don't actually even like, won't students uh, betray your trust? And I'm like, I, that's really not the way trust works. I don't really think of my trust as something someone might betray. Trust is something that I give in hopes of getting it back from the other person. Um, sometimes I fail to get it back from the other person, but to me, it's, it's, it, it, it is not something, I don't necessarily think of it as something that gets betrayed. Um, assessment tends so much to drive and control teaching. Much of what we do in the classroom is determined by the assessment structures we work under. The idea being, and Peter Elbow talks a lot about this, that we're building systems in order to meet these assessment challenges instead of finding the best assessment to support assessment approaches to support our pedagogies. Most of our assessment mechanisms in higher education don't assess what our institutions say they value most. In a longer workshop, I often do an exercise where I bring up the institutional mission of an institution and then have us talk about what they say they value. And then we talk about how the grading system works at the institution and think about how those things do or do not align. None of the institutional missions say things like, I wanna rank students against, our institutional mission is to rank students against one another to create an environment of competition, to create hostile relationships and power dynamics between students and teachers. So our grading systems don't actually support the things that we say our institutions are for. And we're not grading, in fact, the things that we say we want to grade. Grades usually don't measure what we, what we want to, in fact, measure. For example, uh, the food insecurity is a significant factor in determining the average math SAT score. An increase in food insecurity lowers the student's math SAT scores. So something like the SAT isn't actually uh, even testing math proficiency, it's testing whether or not a student is food insecure. And a lot of our grading mechanisms do this. They test how good are we at bias, at creating bias against our students and our marginalized students. Ostrich et al. found that students perform more poorly on exams when they are several weeks removed from receiving food stamp benefits. This, is to, this to me is horrifying. The idea that essentially a student's performance on a standardized assessment doesn't measure how much they know about math or science or you know world history. It measures instead how recently they got their food stamp benefits when they're feeling food insecure. Children displayed a statistically significant increase in cortisol level in anticipation of high stakes testing. Large decreases and large increases in cortisol were associated with underperformance on the high stakes tests. So when, when I talk about emotion, when I talk about the words that I see inside that document when students talked about grades and GPA, we have to recognize that emotion actually is physical and it has physical impacts on us. Trauma actually affects our performance. And there's some great great research, horrifying research out there that shows how things like loneliness and isolation can actually decrease our lifespan. So things like trauma are affecting our performance. They're affecting what grades we get. They're also affecting our lifespan. So they affect us physically. And so now if we know, know that, take a look at something like this. This is text from a five-page set of instructions for a remotely proctored exam at Lawyer University. This is just a few of those five pages. And I'm actually, I'm getting the bad kind of chills up my spine, even just glancing at this. And I've looked at this quite a bit. Um, I, I, I shared this on Twitter and I shared it on Twitter without reading the entire thing because I actually couldn't read the entire thing. I did force myself after the conversation it created, I did force myself to go back and read the entire thing. And I was traumatized just reading these exam instructions. A single page of these exam instructions is bewildering, inscrutable, anxiety producing, pedagogically bereft, four pages is abusive. Only four pages were shared on Twitter because you can only share four images. The actual document is five pages of this. Exam integrity, grade integrity, performance integrity, 
uh, whether or not students are plagiarizing, I argue is better served by three words, I trust you. These words have psychological and pedagogical benefits. Students are more likely to cheat when we start off by calling them cheaters. They're more likely to perform well when we start off by saying, I trust you and I trust you to make critical decisions about your engagement with the course and make critical decisions about your work. Um, I, I just wanna end by reading parts of my assessment um, statement from within my syllabus. This might be too small on the screen for you to read, but if you go to jessiestommel.courses on the web, you can find lots of my syllabi and you're welcome to look at those and borrow stuff willy nilly. Um, I don't necessarily, I've, I've said before, and I mean this somewhat cheekily, that there's no plagiarism in pedagogy. The idea being that we can't do this work by ourselves. We have to draw on the wisdom of other people. Um, so my assessment uh, statement says, this course will focus on qualitative, not quantitative assessment, something we'll discuss during the class, both with reference to your own work and the works we're studying. While you will get a final grade at the end of the term, I will not be grading individual assignments, but rather asking questions and making comments that engage your work rather than simply evaluate it. You will also be reflecting carefully on your own work and the work of your peers. The intention here is to help you focus on working in a more organic way as opposed to working as you think you're expected to. If this process causes more anxiety than it alleviates, see me at any point to confer about your progress in the course to date. If you are worried about your grade, your best strategy should be to join the discussion, do the reading and complete the assignments. You should consider this course, and this is the only line in bold on my syllabus, much unlike the lots of bold and all caps that we see in the, the exam instructions from Laurier University. You should consider this work a busy work free zone. If an assignment does not feel productive, we can find ways to modify, remix, or repurpose the instructions. There's a lot going on there for me. One bit is about, I don't really want the work that students are doing in my courses to be assignments. I don't want it to be something I assign to them and they deliver to me. I don't want my own work to be, a I don't want my, my role to be a receptacle for assignments. Instead, I want this to be a conversation and not just a conversation between me and students, but between the students as well. The other thing that's underlying this is I've been thinking increasingly uh, since the pandemic, more and more about bureaucracy and thinking about bureaucratic abuses and thinking about the ways that bureaucracy can cause trauma, especially at a moment like this when students are already experiencing acute and chronic traumas, that the bureaucracy, the layers of bureaucracy that we're adding to students does harm. One of the things that really upset me is when my institution decided to do a pass no pass option, the standard was, and I'm just gonna turn this off and then keep talking uh, without you looking at my slides. Uh, the standard at the institution, I've watched different institutions make different decisions about this. The standard for the institution was grades and students would have to take bureaucratic steps in order to opt out of grades and opt into a pass no pass. What that essentially did is it created a bureaucratic layer that students needed to go through in order to get support. Anyone who look, reads on pedagogies of care or trauma-informed pedagogy finds out pretty quickly that the students who need support and care the most are the students least poised to be able to deal with the bureaucratic hurdles that we put in front of them in order to get support. And so one of the things I also want us to think about is the degree to which when we're talking about ungrading, we might be talking about removing grades or grading less often, but I think that also a key component is grading less bureau bureaucratically and making the work of grading and even offering feedback less bureaucratic, less onerous for students. And this is probably going back to the learning management systems. One of my deepest problem with the learning management system is it makes the work of teaching bureaucratic. Unless you're really smart and a wizard with a learning management system, the work feels bureaucratic, both for you as the teacher and for students. So thank you. And I'm excited to have a continuing conversation with you all. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. Um, and, and Laura, I'm counting that as a presentation of self, if nothing else. Um, you know, another thread that we're exploring throughout this conversation is the idea of collaboration and building with learners rather than for them or at them or to them. And I noticed in the chat, someone said that, um, you know, 
collaboration, and I say this to my students, collaboration is not a crime. In fact, when I think about the presumption of authority, uh, I don't know anyone who spends more time with their own brains than our learners. And a lot of the time, I will ask them not only questions about the work itself, but also about the process of coming to the work. So I may be looking at an artifact that to me is spectacular and for whatever reason, just hit home with a learner and took them only a fraction of the time it looked like it took them. For another learner, it might be a mediocre artifact that for whatever their reasons and whatever they were going through in the moment, took them a multiple of the amount of time that I'm assuming they put into it. So when I ask questions that are multidimensional and explore the kinds of ideas that we've heard you all discuss today, I get a more complete picture of the person and the learning as opposed to the stuff. And you mentioned a lot about trust, Jesse, and I wanna follow on that because there was a lot in the chat about that as well. The expectation of reciprocity. Um, as adults, uh, or at some point when we learn about relationships, uh, those of us who experience difficult or traumatic or toxic relationships come to discover that what we do doesn't necessarily guarantee an effect from another person. And unfortunately, a lot of the teacher training that people go through, particularly in K-12, uh, suggests that if you do these things, you will get those outcomes. And that leads people to a mentality of scarcity and control and five paid documents from lawyer about, uh, you know, oversight. But I remember, the, does anyone remember the LoJack we were talking about the 80s earlier. Remember the, the car security? And you have the cat and mouse game. So now we've got the low jack. So the security is great on the steering column. So we're going to escalate and hack off the steering column. And then we'll take your car in a different way. And this cat and mouse game that gets perpetuated is something that is actually pretty easy to break the cycle of. So thanks for, for bringing that into the conversation as well. We're at 12.07 and we've got a max of 12.30. And so I'm wondering, I'm, I'm eyeballing the chat. Are there any other things that the presenters would like to key on or are there questions from the attendees that you'd like to propose in the chat that we can respond to? And while we're waiting for questions, one of the things that I wanna, um, I, I loved what Jesse was talking about with cheating. Um, if if what we're doing in our classroom is centered around finding the right answer to a multiple choice question on a quiz that we're giving on Friday, then why not, you know, it, it's going to promote cheating um, because finding out when, what, what year was the Declaration of Independence signed and on what date, oh boy, I don't know. Now, if we ask the question, instead of asking question, the question of, what year and day was the Declaration of Independence signed? Um, ask the question, um, why did they choose July 4th, 1776 as a significant day to sign? And what would have been different had they signed a diff another day? Um, how would America be different? Is a great question, which you can't Google those questions. It takes looking at some of the historical context and, and text and synthesizing and coming up with a judgment call, which you can't Google. So if we're asking questions which just are, have a one-to-one -one ratio of a right answer, we're gonna get cheating. And it's gonna be pretty apparent. And really, you know, in all honesty, if I didn't know what day the Declaration of Independence was signed, I would ask Siri about it and it would tell me, and did I cheat? No, I probably didn't because what does it really matter what day it was signed as long as I celebrate 4th of July, shoot off my fireworks and have my, um, have my barbecue going. Um, but asking those tough questions, how would it be different if it was a different day? Is something that you can't Google, which is gonna really wrap our kids' minds around something important. So I would say if we really wanna get rid of cheating, then let them Google things, let them do those types of things that are gonna help them to solve problems that are real and applicable to their lives. There's also an element of this that, you know, in addition to asking the kinds of questions, I like to ask my questions or my students questions about authors, like, what do you think their morning routine is? You know, 
are they hung over? Are they doing yoga? And not only are you not going to find most of those questions on Google, but there's a person behind the words and there's a connection around meaning and a lot of other stuff. But, you know, there's also the kind of cheating that doesn't show up in the direct transaction between educator and learner. Uh, the classic example is the, the law school or the medical student who gets to the library first and rips out the pages. Um, Aaron, in your chapter in Ungrading, you mentioned how this doesn't just turn students against learning or the authority figures, it can also turn people against each other. And I'm wondering what all of your views are on the collaboration versus competitive model in the culture and how ungrading contributes to that shift. This is kind of an answer to that and then kind of a uh, reflection on some of the comments earlier about feedback. And one of the things I've been thinking more and more about feedback, I've got an entire chapter, something or other in my brain about feedback that I'm gonna write at, down at some point. But the gist is that I think that we often hold up grades and feedback next to one another as though they are opposites, as though one is, one is in an ungraded system, grades are bad and feedback is good. But I actually am increasingly having, taking issue with some of the ways that we think about feedback. Because if my role with a student is to, uh, I guess what I would say is that I wanna have a dialogue with students. And I think that we can be just as patronizing with feedback as we are with grades. We can do just as much harm with feedback as we do with grades. And so I think that there is both good and bad uses of, well, maybe there's only bad uses of grades, but there are both good and bad uses of feedback. Um, and so I want to, I, I, I would love to know what Aaron or Laura think about that and, and help me continue to push on that idea. But to go back to your question, David, I think that the key is getting students giving feedback to one another and helping model what that looks like for them and help them learn how to do that effectively. Honestly, giving feedback is really hard and people often when they, when they think about peer feedback, well, I try to have my students give peer feedback and they're not very good at it. And, and I think to myself, well, are any of us good at giving fee constructive feedback the first time that we do it? Isn't that a skill that would be useful to have students learn? Isn't it okay for them to fumble through giving feedback to one another and have it not be perfect? Is the fact that their feedback isn't as good as we would want it to be a reason for us to step in and assert our authority and honestly our dominance over them and their work? To some degree, I think we need to recognize, and, and Peter Elbow talks about this, he talks about the difference between ranking, evaluating, and liking. And ranking is the thing he says, don't do any of that. That's just pitting students against one another, and it's just saying one student is better than another. And that's what most of our grading systems do. 97.3 doesn't tell you anything different from 95.2, except that 97.3 is more than 95.2. And then he talks about evaluating, and he talks about the importance of teachers doing a certain amount of evaluation, which means helping students understand from their expert perspective when they've been successful and helping point out where they're successful and how they were successful. And I talk only about success because I think that that's more effective than telling people where they went wrong. Tell people what and how they did something correctly and then help them duplicate that. I think is the most effective way to offer feedback. And then when a student is going to do harm, that's when you step in and, correct, and give a course correction. Um, liking. He, when he writes about liking, it's it's fascinating because he doesn't really describe it clearly. It's not she's not exactly sure what it is. He fumbles even through his description of it. But it's us being readers of student work, and I really think that that's important is for us to be readers of student work, engaging with them as our full selves, not in a hierarchical role. And I think that trying to find ways to have our feedback be as much of that as possible, as much as I'm a human being coming upon your work, and I. I have awe at the amazing things you're capable of. And I'm going to tell you about that awe. Like, I feel like that's a really good productive kind of feedback and also key to collaboration to loop it back to what you're talking about. I just, I just have to jump in because I've got that chapter in my head too. So one of us <laughs> needs to write this chapter. But what Jesse described is exactly my experience in giving feedback to students. And I know we had started off talking about cheating, 
I'll just say my usual thing. We should not let cheating suck the oxygen out of the room here. In some ways, I don't even like talking about it because we have much bigger, more real, more difficult problems, which are failure to learn, right? All the students who get an A, a B, or a C, or whatever, they pass their classes, and they'll flat out tell you they didn't learn anything useful. And if they think they didn't learn anything useful, that means, in fact, they did not learn anything useful. Um, I was in a conversation about ungrading with some STEM faculty at my school last week, which first of all just is amazing, right, that there's a conversation going on. It's like what Jesse said earlier. It's really a movement that's um, picking up steam, so to speak. And one of the fascinating things that we got off into there was talking about how we use grading and assessment, but grading primarily as the sort of document of assessment for curriculum alignment and how badly this works out, right? So the, the science professors in that conversation were perfectly willing to admit that even though students got their passing grade or even though they got their A in a foundational course in their science, when they reached the upper division courses and were asked to apply that knowledge in creative, challenging, difficult, unexpected ways, which is what scientists actually do. I'm sorry if there's noise out there. There's, um, there's someone in our yard. Anyway, um, the the grades aren't doing the work we need the grades to do in terms of curriculum alignment so i don't have answers to it i just want everybody to realize that grades will not do the difficult work of curriculum alignment for you and one of the things you need to ask students is what have you learned in this class right not how you have gamed the system in one way or another or not how you obediently did what the teacher told you but what did you learn that you're going to take and apply elsewhere? And I have to put in a pitch for this book I love to talk about. It's a project that went on at my school called The Meaningful Writing Project, where they just flat out interviewed graduating seniors and asked them what was the most meaningful writing you did in college. And the answers are fascinating, right? Because the writing happened in all kinds of disciplines and all kinds of classes and all kinds of genres and all kinds of teaching contexts. And they just ask the students to guide their research into what that meaningful writing was. How did it happen? And so that book is out. It's called The Meaningful Writing Project. And they're doing a follow-up book apparently right now that's going to come out from West Virginia, the same uh, press that published the ungrading book, which are sort of practical ap applications of what they learn from their research that you can use in the classroom, but you can figure that out for yourselves, right? So if you're looking for something to read that will inspire you, once again, with student voices and student reflections on what education is, The Meaningful Writing Project is a, is a great book to look at and and better than thinking about cheating right i mean start with what the students say works and then build on that which is what jesse was saying about you know feedback start with a positive and build on it follow a positive lead because that's what's going to really work and lead you forward absolutely and jesse i think you made a really important point too about how well students provide feedback and what we do with that experience. It seems like we need to offer a meaningful midpoint between the world of eyes on your own paper, do your own work, don't speak unless you raise your hand, and life in our culture, which is why can't you communicate and be a better team player? So where else are they going to have that experience and gain those skills if they don't take those first steps with us? Um, there's a comment in the chat about, uh, as a side note on a criminologist, uh, and blank walls and criminality and seeing this over my shoulder right next to that chat you know one banksy can be worth a thousand words i suppose um but what's criminal is often determined by context and if we think about it you know graffiti is the oldest written communication we human beings have um but that's not legal and yet the billboards that ruin every possible view shed are and so when we talk about these things in school, not that everything's relative, but I think we can make some meaningful distinctions between what is a victim uh, perpetuated bad act that is aggressive and requires restoration versus something that students have been trained to do by the incentives that have been put before them. Um, I used to have a disincentive policy that said, if I ever catch you cheating, I won't let you know. Um, it's just that when it comes to finals week, you're gonna fail the entire course. And okay, so we play that incentive disincentive game, but in the end, it comes back to what Laura is saying about the feedback process. And because we're getting to 
1230. I'm wondering if any of you or all of you would uh, like to contribute some concluding words as we wrap up. Yeah, I wanted to jump off of something with feedback. And one of the most powerful forms of feedback you can get or you can give is start by asking the student, first of all, would you like me to give you feedback? Mm. Giving them that opportunity to say, yeah, I do, or no, I'm struggling with this right now and I'm enjoying this struggle. Uh, I've learned that multiple times with my golfers um, that sometimes they don't want me saying anything. They just want to work through it. And that's okay. We need to do that. The second thing that I think we need to do is ask, what would you like feedback on? One of the best things I ever got, it was about four or five years ago, I had a young lady, she wrote an essay and she asked, is this good? That was the feedback she wanted. And we looked over and I just asked her a bunch of questions. I said, well, you know, here's what you wrote. Um, is this why you like, it was a video game she was writing about. Is this why you like the video game because of the history of it, the design of it and the, the uh, platform that it was built on? She goes, no. And I said, well, if that's not what's interesting to you, why do you think that somebody else would think it's good? And she just grabbed the paper, th crumbled it up, threw it away and rewrote the essay about why she loved this video game, what made this video game amazing. And it turned out to be an incredible piece of writing. And um, I really enjoyed reading the second one. And so I feel like when we, if we wanna give good feedback to our students, first of all, we have to start by asking permission because not, they don't always want it. And second, let's find out what they want feedback on. And then we can get into other elements that as, as the expert in, in the room, we can help them develop in certain areas too. But yeah, give them that autonomy over their work. I was recently saying a, a something quite similar and actually Aaron was in the room when I was saying it. And someone asked, well, what if the students are just wrong? Don't you have to tell them they're wrong? What if they're just wrong and you know they're wrong? That's not quite how the person asked it. The person was actually very nice and it was a really useful, good conversation. So I'm kind of caricaturing the question, but partly because I've gotten versions of that question. What do you do when a student is just wrong? And my answer to that is gonna be a, maybe seem a little bit flip, um, but it's let them be wrong. Being wrong is part of, part of the work that we do. Being wrong and then discovering that you're wrong without someone telling you at every turn is a key part of the educational process. I, my job as a teacher is not to step in and tell everyone when they're wrong. And, and then I basically said, there are key moments when that isn't true. And that's if I'm teaching and the two examples I gave, if I'm teaching a chemistry class and someone's gonna set fire to themselves or, their, or others, then I step in. Or if a student, is, if we're having a discussion about race and gender issues, for example, and a student says something that's doing harm to other people in the room, then it's my, it's my role to step in and talk about that and open a conversation about it and also to stop them from doing it. But those, those, those moments where we should step in are so few and far between. I think that we should always err on the side of not stepping in. And so this to speak to what Aaron's saying, like why comment on 65 things if the person really only needs help with one or two things and they know what those one or two things are? Um, not, and sure, not all, not all students in all situations will know what they need help with, but I don't necessarily think it's our, our role to step in and tell them what they need help with. I think in certain cases, if they say, well, I'm really struggling and I don't know where I'm going wrong, then those are moments where you, when you do step in and give them your thoughts and your feedback. Um, but I think that being really judicious in how and when we give feedback is important. And I'll just chime in about a, a sort of general all-purpose thing you can do when you're giving, say, difficult feedback that you think a student might find hard to hear is to always build choices into it, right? I mean, there's never just, if something is wrong, there's never just one way to fix it if what you're talking about is expanding your knowledge and awareness and thinking about how it might happen again or not or thinking about how you need to go back and ameliorate what you did. I mean, they're all kinds of complexities in any situation. And my experience has been that when you give students choices, maybe not tons of choices, you don't want to overwhelm them, but give them a sense it's like, okay, you know, here are some things you could do. Think about what seems most important to you or the most doable or what do you want to do? And Jesse had said originally something about choices that I thought was so brilliant about how we're going to respond after the pandemic. 
And if we could find a way to build more choice into everything, you know, letting faculty choose or not to use the LMS, letting them choose or not to teach remotely. And the same thing goes for students too. Choice and the freedom to make choices, creative choices, that's something that's really important to me. And grades tend to stamp out that room for choice. So just as an all-purpose thing that you can use to think about when you interact with students one-on-one, -on -one, when you design a course, think about choices and how you're opening up room for them to really make choices, like Aaron was saying, to think about what they want and be able to communicate that. Yeah, and one of the things I would like to add on to this is, and I'm, I'm, this is something new to me, and I'm just getting into this as of last couple months, is instead of saying um, you didn't capitalize in this sentence, as as an example, um, instead of pointing out that they didn't use ca proper capitalization, ask them, can you help me understand why you're not using capitalization? Maybe it's intentional. Now I have a student, I was sharing this, Jesse heard me talk about this. I had a student who just wasn't capitalizing constantly. And I asked him the question, oh, I just forgot to. Well, after a period of time, I just said, I, I refuse to read anything from you if, if you don't use proper capitalization at this point, because you're being lazy. <laughs> and, and sometimes kids are gonna be lazy. But I think asking questions, can you help me understand what's going on with this? Is a great way for them to process it in their own heads as to, am I doing this correctly or am I doing, are there other modalities to do this? Or, but they have to think it through in order to answer that question. And so it's something new to me. I'm really working through this and I'm hoping to write a blog post about this eventually, but um, yeah. I'm looking forward to that one. Just yeah. to chime in, what, what Aaron is talking about is exactly what I love about teaching because when you ask students, they will sometimes tell you things you never even, guessed about how they use technology, how they do their work, what their work context is. They surprise me all the time. I've been doing this for forever and they still constantly surprise me. So I can't guess what the answer is. I have to ask them, they have to tell me. That's the only way I'm gonna find out. Yeah, and while it's true that we can trust without requiring something in return or needing something from our students, it's also okay to have some self-empathy and regard the fact that we put a lot of care and a lot of work into our presence and what we provide. And it's really okay to say, oh, well, you didn't really look at that yet? Great, let me know when you do, and I'll read it with the same care that you write it. And at the same time, I also wanna focus on one last thing before we go. We've talked a lot about the learner-centered approach and, and the care and the empathy that our students sometimes don't get in other quarters and we have the opportunity to extend through ungrading. I also think it's important to remember that institutionally, there are entire practices that have been made really kind of irrelevant by the way that students are labeled and stamped and put through the system. Corporations would never think of hiring an employee based on a number or a letter. A sports team wouldn't sign a, an athlete for millions of dollars or pounds for the same reason, we want the qualitative and quantitative information. Law firms tell even graduates of law school, well, great, now that you're here, let's teach you how to be a lawyer. So I think that we have an opportunity not just to help learners, certainly as humans, and help re-engage and rekindle some of the benefits of teaching in the first place, but also making education more relevant to the greater, grander whole. And for that, on behalf of everybody here, I just cannot thank the three of you enough. Um, I am honored to be in your presence. I love what you've had to offer. I'm, I'm already excited about watching this recording over again and curating the notes for everyone. Um, any last parting words of wisdom before we go? I always just say have fun, everybody. I know it's a hard time to have fun, but if you can have fun, have fun, right? Yeah. And yeah, honestly, make sure that you let yourself feel that joy that we see on Laura's face. And if you need some help and if your joy feels really complicated, Bell Hooks, Teaching to Transgress, she talks about joy and she talks about it with a nuance that I think can help you find it in a moment like this. Um, so that's my recommendation. Yeah, I was going to be exactly what I was going to say. I echo what Jesse said. If you're not finding joy in teaching, then find a different way to teach. And on that happy, fun, joyous, contented note, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day wherever you are in the world. And I look forward to staying in touch. 
If anybody wants to reach out for anything before the notes come up, please feel free to find me uh, via davidpreston.net or on Twitter at Preston Learning. Thanks everyone once again, Jesse, Laura, Aaron, the profession's a better place for you. And I hope everybody buys on grading and adopts some of this stuff. Thanks again.